these jellyfish. I mean, how about a hand for our kids' ministry team? They do such a great job. <laughs> VBS is going to be outstanding this week. Um, I hope if you're not signed up to be a part of that in any way, maybe you consider doing that. It's a lot of fun, a lot of energy, and, uh, and a great experience. And again, all about scuba, uh, scuba diving. I love the ocean, by the way. Um, I used to spend summers uh, out visiting my aunt in uh, Cape Cod. My aunt Penn lived out there. So we'd go out there, and uh, my dad taught me to body surf. And I just love the ocean. I love riding waves. Um, that was until my parents decided to take us to see the movie Jaws. <laughs> yeah, about a shark that eats people, right? And, and they took us to see this movie while we were in Cape Cod, about a shark that attacks people in less than three feet of water. And it, I don't know if you know, know, know where that movie was filmed, just off the shore of Cape Cod. <laughs> so uh, we eventually, I eventually got myself back in the water uh, with a whole new awareness of that there's stuff in the ocean that can eat you and that maybe wants to eat you, um, which is really the story we're looking at this morning, the story of Jonah, who was eaten by a large fish uh, that we're in our series <laughs> Uh, called Revealed, and it's about these Old Testament stories and what they have to say about Jesus and revealing Jesus to us, even in the Old Testament. And Jonah is one of the most popular stories and most well-known stories from the Bible. Even if you've never opened a Bible, you've probably heard the story of Jonah and the whale. And if you called it that, you've probably been corrected by a Bible snob who told you, no, it wasn't a whale. It was a big fish that God prepared to swallow Jonah. Uh, either way, it's a familiar story to a lot of us, a little too familiar evidently to some people, um, but we all know it and we kind of have grasped the Sunday school lessons from Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the big fish, right? Jonah runs from God and God prepares this big fish to swallow him and then Jonah prays from the belly of that fish and, and the whale spits Jonah back out onto a beach, and then Jonah reluctantly goes and does what God asked him to do. And the takeaway is, don't run from God. Do what God says. That's the lesson of this children's story. So I'd like to invite the band back up. We're going to continue. <laughs> All right, if we actually take a deeper dive, uh, we learn it's not just a children's story. In fact, some Bible scholars argue it's a story about the dangerous influence of politics and religious nationalism on our faith. And I'm going to set that right over here. Some say it's a parable like Jesus taught. And others say it's a myth or it's a legend with an important lesson or something important that we're supposed to learn from this. And many others believe it's an historical account, that this is uh, to be taken literally. And they argue that the ancient Israelites believed this really happened, and they even argue that Jesus promoted this as something that was true. And unfortunately, I think that's where a lot of adults get stuck. We tend to throw out the story of Jonah and the big fish because we just don't believe someone could actually survive being swallowed by a whale. It's impossible. Or is it? I want you to meet Michael Packard. He's a commercial lobster diver from, you won't believe this, Cape Cod. Uh, he's the subject of a new documentary called In the Whale, where Boston Globe reporter David Abel tells Michael's story about being swallowed by a whale while scuba diving for lobsters. And Michael says that he felt like he got hit by a truck and everything went dark. And at first, he thought it was a great white shark because he's encountered those before on dives. And then he realized whatever had him didn't have any teeth. He was in the mouth of a whale. And his partner in the boat said there was a huge splash and there was thrashing. And he saw Michael pop up in the mess and the whale disappeared. And meanwhile, Michael started searching frantically for his breathing regulator that had popped out of his mouth when the whale hit him. For the next 30 seconds, he thought he was going to die. This is how you're going to go, Michael. Yeah. This is how you're going to die. In the mouth of a whale. Well, the whale wasn't too happy about the situation either. And Packard says after about 30 seconds, he was basically spit out. I couldn't believe it. 
I couldn't believe I got out of that. I don't know if this guy's story is true or not, and I don't know if the story of Jonah is true or if it's a parable. I do know that the Bible has all kinds of different writings in it. You know, it has some history, some prophecy, poetry, letters, parables. And I also believe that if we spend our time debating whether or not Jonah actually survived the stomach acid and being crushed and suffocating inside that whale, we're going to miss the point of the story. We'll miss the story of God's relentless love for all people. And what this story reveals about Jesus' instruction to us to share his unrelenting grace, even in our most challenging relationships. That's what the story of Jonah is really about. God's mercy and love has no boundaries, and ours shouldn't either. God shows unrelenting grace in his pursuit of Jonah to rescue him, to get him on board with his mission. And in the same way, Jesus pursues us and compels us to go after others with the same unrelenting grace. Because God's mercy and love has no boundaries. And ours shouldn't either. We don't know a whole lot about Jonah or what he taught. Um, He's given a very simple message in the first couple verses of Jonah. In fact, he says this, The Lord gave this message to Jonah. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up, and he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. God says to Jonah, I want you to go east, and Jonah heads west. God says, I want you to go to the city, and instead Jonah goes to the sea. Jonah wants to get as far away from this assignment from God as possible, and so he runs. He runs away from Nineveh. He runs away from God. And I can't really say that I blame him too much because God has asked Jonah to do a really, really hard thing. He says, go to this city, this big city, 120,000 people, but not just people, the city where your greatest enemies, the biggest threat to Israel, where they all live. And then I want you to go and tell them how wicked they are and that I'm about to destroy them. I really struggle with passages like this from the Old Testament, where God sends somebody to go preach against a group of people, or he threatens violence, or he threatens judgment, because it seems inconsistent with the God I've come to know through the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul teaches us that Jesus is the perfect image of God, in whom the fullness of God's nature lives. And then we read the stories about Jesus and we see how Jesus interacts, right? We see his love and his grace and his mercy and his kindness, his joy and his peace. But here in Jonah and in other places in the Old Testament, God seems a little harsh, like almost merciless in his judgment. And I wonder, what are we supposed to do with this inconsistency? It's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I do have a couple of thoughts after reading through Jonah. First is this, um, we read it's the wickedness of Nineveh that God was preparing to judge. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and Assyria was known for its, its brutal torture of its enemies. I mean, we think about like some of the terrorist groups today who do some really intense things like ISIS, and they had nothing on the Assyrians. I can't even share with you the details. It's so bad. They also were a city of people who would sacrifice babies to their god, Moloch. So if Jonah and the Israelites ever wanted God's judgment to fall on another nation, it would have been Assyria. It would have been the city of Nineveh. They were wicked. God is teaching Jonah and the people of his day, hey, I have your back. And also, his patience with wicked people 
and their cancerous spread of evil has limits. But God is also teaching them that he is the God of unrelenting grace. See, God doesn't want to bring judgment on them. Right? He wants them to turn. That's why he's sending Jonah with a warning to them. He wants to give them a chance to, to turn from their wicked practices to him so that they can be saved, so that they can come to know him. In fact, later in the book, we read that God tells Jonah, he said, listen, they don't know their right hand from their left hand. They don't know good from evil. They don't know what they're doing. They're lost. They're confused. So go, because I want them to find their way to me. I want them to find their way in this world. And throughout the Bible, we see a holy and just God consistently stand up against and punish evil. And we see a loving God who patiently pursues and forgives and invites even wicked people into a relationship with him. And not because of anything they've done, they've earned or that they deserve, but because he's a God of unrelenting love and grace. And I think there's one more really important lesson in God sending Jonah to Nineveh. I think it's a nod to Jesus and his mission. God's actually preparing his people for a new day when he's going to send Jesus into the world to reveal his plan in full. Jesus taught, don't judge your enemies, but love your enemies. And this was always part of God's plan, right? It was to love and bless the whole world, not just the Israelites, but their enemies as well. The Israelites were just chosen first. But from that very first invitation to Abraham to become part of God's family, God made it clear that being in the family meant sharing God's blessing with the rest of the world. Yet his people kept getting stuck over and over again, thinking that they were special, that they were in and others are out. So God's mission for Jonah has as much to do with pursuing a nation's heart, getting his family back on track with his plan, as it does with saving a wicked city. God cares deeply about how his family treats people, especially people who are not yet part of that family. And God is attempting to grow their understanding and ours of that truth and what faith in him requires of us so that next generations will encounter Jesus and follow him to bless our broken world. But Jonah runs. And I'm surprised it's not because he was afraid of the Ninevites. He actually runs from God. It says it twice in those first three verses. He's trying to get away from God because he hated this truth of God's unrelenting love for his enemies. He hated the idea that God's power and his love could actually change their hearts and minds. He says this, that's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are so eager to turn back from destroying people. I'd rather be dead than alive if what you sent me to tell them about their destruction does not happen. Jonah loved Israel. And like most of the Israelites, he hated, he hated the enemies of the nation. In fact, he says he'd rather die himself if God's not going to destroy them. He doesn't want to risk the chance of God becoming friends with his enemies. What would others think? What would others think if Jonah, the prophet of Israel, went to their enemies and got them to turn to be part of what God was doing in the world, and they had to give up centuries of hate? and of wanting to get even and put uh, the Assyrians back in their place, they would have been repulsed at this idea. They would have canceled Jonah in a second. Are we any different? Maybe it's not nations. Maybe sometimes it's just even our neighbors or even in our own families. I had a friend tell me uh, a couple weeks ago, about the challenge that came up in their family when their mom died. And they were trying to settle the estate and things just went wrong. 
fact, things went so bad that one of their sisters told them that they could never forgive them. And my friend's like, I don't even know what I did wrong, but it's destroying my friend. It's destroying the family. It's not just others. Like, I have my own issues with this. The other night, sleeping, feeling good, right? And 4 a.m., a motorcycle decides to make the road, the street in front of our house, its drag strip. I sit straight up in bed. It's like, what was it? It was so loud. And then I thought, maybe I imagined it. I'm just starting to drift back to sleep. 4.15, throttles by again. And now I'm like, I'm pretty sure I heard God say, you need to go preach judgment against them. 4.30, and now I'm just laying in bed thinking about all the things I'd like to do to this guy on the motorcycle, you know. I should go throw some nails out there on the... Well, what if I stretched a wire across the... I know, it's wicked, like... It's coming out of my heart, but I'm just so angry, right? A lot of times, our desires don't line up with God's desires. And even when I'm doing well, like, I kind of want both things. Like, yeah, I want him to turn. I want him to repent, stop doing that up and down my street, be forgiven. I also kind of want to see him pay a little bit, right, for stealing my sleep. Jonah's story is our story. God wants to use Jonah as an example to Israel and to us of just how serious he is about his command to love even our enemies with the same unrelenting grace of Jesus. Because God's love has no boundaries. Ours shouldn't either. So Jonah's sleeping. He's asleep on a ship to Tarshish. Say that three times fast. Jonah's asleep on a ship to Tarshish. But the Lord heard a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. And the captain and the ship's crew, they start praying frantically to their gods, and nothing happens. And so they wake up Jonah and say, start praying to your God, maybe he will save us, and nothing happens. And so the storm rages on, and they decide they're going to cast lots, throw dice, draw straws, whatever it is, to see whose fault it is that this storm keeps raging. And of course... It points to what we already know. It's Jonah's fault. And so they go and they ask him these questions. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? And Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. Which sounds kind of like a real religious answer. It'd be kind of like one of us fast. We'd say, well, I'm a Christian from Iowa. Is that God's kind of, is that heaven? No, but it's darn close. You should see the movie. I know Jesus. I worship him. I just don't want to go and do what he asked me to do, see the people that he asked me to see, because I know he's going to forgive them. And I'd rather die. So Jonah says, just throw me overboard and you will all be okay. And the sailors are like, we can't throw him overboard, right? We can't do this. And after some negotiations and trying a bunch of different stuff, nothing changes. And so they actually pray to Jonah's God, and then they throw him overboard, and the storm stops. And this crew of pagan sailors worships Jonah's God. And there's so much more to be said about the man of God who refuses to do what God asks and refuses to show people mercy, while this group of people who had never known God demonstrates great mercy to him and then worships his God. But we don't have time. Out in the ocean, the waters overtake Jonah. Seaweed wrapped itself around his head. And I sank down to the very roots of the mountains, he prays. But you, O Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. And we read, now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah runs from God, but the Lord pursues him with a storm. Jonah is drowning because he told the sailors to toss him overboard, but the Lord prepares a big fish to save him. And like Mike Packer, Jonah thinks he's going to die in the belly of that big fish, but the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. 
Early in our marriage, Cindy and I made a decision um, that was a really bad decision, motivated by all of the wrong things. But the Lord sent me into a dark place where he led me to pray a desperate prayer that only God could answer and did in amazing ways. When I was a teenager and a young adult, I was addicted to pornography. But the Lord helped me overcome my addiction. My sister and I, for years, didn't have a relationship. But the Lord is helping us to restore that relationship. I don't know for sure what's going on with you and your life right now. Maybe you're in your own dark place and you feel alone like God is distant. But the Lord is with you in your despair. Maybe you're running from something you've done and you don't think God can forgive you, but the Lord pursues you with his forgiveness and his love. Or maybe you just don't think God sees you or hears you, but the Lord pursues you with unrelenting grace. Author and pastor Paul Tripp says these are the three most important words, the words we most need to remember from this story, but the Lord. Three words that signal God interrupting our lives with unrelenting grace. And sometimes it feels like a storm. Maybe it feels like being swallowed by darkness or like vomit on a beach. Maybe it's a word of truth that stings a little bit or a stern warning or rebuke from someone we don't like. But the Lord is at work. His grace often shows up in unexpected ways. But the Lord, as sure as he pursued Jonah, pursues you with the same relentless love. And he has unlimited resources. He will do anything in his pursuit of us. He wasn't mad at Jonah. He just wanted him and us to get it. God's love has no boundaries. And ours shouldn't either. Jonah repents. He turns back to God. And you can read his prayer in chapter 2. It's pretty amazing. Um, You'll see that he gets a few details fuzzy. He's still like blaming God for like um, sending Jonah away from his presence. Gets a few of these details wrong. Um, That's okay. And he's still reluctant. But he promises God he's going to do what he asks. And so he goes to Nineveh. And on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. And he goes outside the city, and he waits for God to destroy this city. But it doesn't happen. The king and all the people and even the cows... Like they put on sackcloth and they repent. They turn to God. They turn away from their wickedness. And God forgives them and the city is spared. Eight words in English. Five in Hebrew. You're probably thinking, Jeff, you should take a lesson. But these weren't exactly friendly words. They didn't feel good. They didn't even reveal... God's strong desire to save the people of Nineveh and bless them. But the Lord uses Jonah's message anyway. And Jonah is mad. He complains to God, says, I knew you'd do this. I knew you'd show them mercy. Just kill me now. And the Lord tries one more time to win Jonah's heart. And you'll have to read the ending. In fact, you should just read the whole story. It's really short and it's kind of funny, actually. But it's a story that reveals Jesus and his mission to us. Jonah, a man of God, spends three days and nights in the belly of a big fish. Jesus did the same in a grave. But where Jonah was a man, Jesus is God. And what Jonah confused, Jesus made clear. God showed Jonah incredible mercy. And Jesus shows us The same great mercy. The question for us this week is, will we lean into God's assignment 
and follow Jesus to show that same mercy to others? Or will we run? Let's pray. God, your love has no boundaries. And God, if we haven't yet had our but for the Lord moment, it's probably because we just haven't recognized it yet. Because I believe you are constantly pursuing us. So I ask, Lord, that you would help us to stop and consider the ways that maybe you are working to communicate with us, to get us to turn to you so that we can be part of your blessing and so that we can join you in that mission to go and help others encounter Jesus and bless a broken world. Thank you for your tremendous love and your mercy. Meet us where we are right here in this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.